Okay, welcome to the ophthalmic lecture. We're going to focus on glaucoma, but we'll talk about a couple of other things today, so, including anesthetics, allergy relief, lubrications, anti-infectives, and of course, like I said, glaucoma. Our dosage preparations, uh, eye drops are a little bit interesting. They are prepared in sterile uh, environments. So once you open an eye drop, you usually only have a certain amount of window where the manufacturer said it's still likely to be pure until possible that it got an infection or not infection but contamination I should say and that has to do with uh, the sterility of the product so the only point I'm bringing up here is that uh, just to if people have an eye drop that they use like three years ago and want to use it again it could be kind of gunky and who knows what's living in it now they're again only pure for so long so follow the directions in the bottle um, ask the pharmacist um, not all eye drops will apply for that, but most have some sort of a uh, shelf life once you open them. It's different from the expiration date on the bottle. Uh, suspensions contain particles, and so they need to be shaken beforehand. There are ointments. Ointments are really goopy, and if you put an ointment in your eye, you probably have a hard time seeing, but um, sometimes they're useful for kids and um, people who are putting them on at night, potentially, is like a lubricating thing. Uh, gels are usually preferred if you're going to do that, um, and then they're usually buffered pH so that they don't burn when they touch your eyes, hopefully. But that can depend on the product as well. Patient education is really important for eye drops. I will ask a question on this in the exam, so make sure you're familiar with the correct process. It's really not that complicated, and it, it sounds pretty easy. I think the biggest things to think about, um, the questions that people might not know right off the top of their head, are to wait five minutes in between medications. So if you're using multiple ophthalmic agents, you wanna wait five minutes in between drops. Um, use an ointment or gel after applying any drops. If you put an ointment or gel in first and then you put drops on top of it, the drops will probably just roll off of your eye and then down your cheek. Try to keep your eyes closed one minute after instilling a drop. Keep them in a cold, dry, dry place and watch your expiration dates again. Some ophthalmic specific abbreviations, if you guys haven't gone through this, I'll just review them quick. GTT stands for drop, or sometimes you see GTTS, which is drops. Uh, also, it's also used for drip too. So like if you're running a continuous infusion on somebody in the ICU, that's obviously not ophthalmic, that's intravenous, but you'll see GTT used for that too. But GTT is a drop or a drip. Um, Oculus is O, O, U is both eyes, O, D, uh, Oculus, Dexter, or right eye, O, S, left, left handed people are sinister is how you can remember that one, O, S is the left eye. In case you don't like using weird SIGs and Latin abbreviations, you can always just type it out, and that's fine too. I would avoid using things like R, E, or L, E, those aren't really acceptable abbreviations, but um, if you're going to not use the Latin ones, I would just write out right eye or left eye. Um, so here's an example of a SIG, and still 1 to 2 G GTTS, OU, QHS, PRN, 1 to 2 drops both eyes at bedtime as needed. <clears throat> okay, some procedural stuff. Local anesthetics like uh, would be helpful for foreign body removal, cataract surgery. They're going to penetrate nerve endings around the eye and block nerve impulses uh, from initiating and conducting. Uh, so they block sodium channels. So anything that ends in cane, we'll talk about canes other places, but um, example would be propericane, one to two drops every 25 minutes, it gives, sorry, one to two drops gives you about 25 minutes of activity. Um, repeated use may cause permanent damage, so you, you should only really need like a simple, um, a small amount for a short procedure. If you need to use more, you can certainly do that, but it, this is usually the case of how it's going to be used. Anticholinergic drugs, usually dose one to two times topically immediately prior to procedure. They cause mydriasis, they open up the pupil. Several options, they all do the same thing. Um, Cyclopenolate and probably tropicamide are the ones I see used most often. Atropine tends to last a lot longer, so if you give it to somebody um, prior to their eye exam, they're going to be having weird vision all day, whereas these drugs are a little bit shorter acting. <clears throat> Anti-allergy, so allergic conjunctivitis, short-term use, most people are going to take it for four to six weeks and not longer than that. Temporary relief of itching, usually associated again with allergic reactions or uh, seasonal allergies. There's a couple of mast cell stabilizers or antihistamines. Most of these drugs are twice day dosing. <clears throat> the most common ones I probably see are olpatidine, which is patinol or patidae. Patidae is just a different formulation that lasts longer. It's a once daily, hence the name pat-a-day. Clever, right? 
um, but it is just a daily antihistamine. Ketotifen is uh, another one that this brand name Zatador that's used quite frequently. There are some vasoconstrictors. So if you think about like Visine or things like that, they prevent those really red looking eyes. So they're just gonna to be topical vasoconstrictors. Uh, most of these are over the counter. Um, if you do have narrow angle gly glaucoma, we'll talk about that in a bit. That's an absolute contraindication to using these. That's a medical emergency though, so it's different. So we'll talk about that. <clears throat> Lubrication, uh, pick your poison here. There's a ton of different products on the market. I just have patients probably start with a cheap one and see if that works for them and then maybe w work their way up. There are lots of different things. So if you're like, oh, try a refresh. Well, there's like 12 different refresh formulations. So which refresh do you want me to try? Um, I think it depends on when they're using it. If they're using it during the day, I'd recommend a simple um, solution or suspension. If they're using it in the evening or overnight, a gel or uh, even an ointment might be okay. Cyclosporin is, uh, we talk about this during transplant, but it comes as a eye drop as well. It's a brand name Restasis. It's used for chronic eye dryness, which is usually caused by de decreased tear production and um, causes ocular inflammation. It's associated with a disease, disease called keratoconjunctivitis sicca. Anyway, um, not very much adverse effects with this. You might feel like there's some stinging, burning, or pain, or some people feel like there's something in their eye potentially, but it's twice daily use and it stimulates tear production and might suppress inflammation. Over time, it's thought that some of these side effects will likely wear off, but this might be some of the stuff a patient would experience initially. A lot of people use Restasis, it's a really common drug. <clears throat> Anti-infectives, talked about this a little bit during ID. Bacterial conjunctivitis, common in childhood, copious thick secretions, Compared to viral is usually the difference there. Causative microbes, Staph aureus, Strep pneumo, H flu, MCAT. Um, antibiotics available are listed there. And again, we, we already went over this stuff and I'm not gonna retest you on this. Glaucoma, all right, let's get to the meat and potatoes of the lecture. It's a group of ocular disorders that lead to optic neuropathy. So which causes increased intraocular pressure is the pharmacologic target. So I should clarify, this isn't like we aren't, we aren't trying to increase intraocular pressure, we're actually trying to decrease. However, this is the goal of how we manipulate this. By decreasing pressure, we improve with the glaucoma treatment. Um, characterized by vision, vision loss in a specific pattern. Open angle is the common chronic one. Incidence increases with age. Closed angle is the leading cause of glaucoma-related blindness. It's a medical emergency, and you can lose your vision very quickly if you get closed angle glaucoma. It's not really necessarily age-specific. However, if you do have open angle, I believe the risk is higher that you uh, to go to closed angle. A uh, typical glaucoma vision pattern, you kind of get encroaching black spots and blurry spots around the edges of your vision until you can't really see much more than tunnel vision. So open angle, slowly clogging of the drainage canals. There's a wide and open angle between the iris and the cornea. Develops slowly, lifelong condition, has symptoms and damage that are not acutely noticed. Usually don't notice glaucoma until it's been present for quite a while. Closed angle, again, this is fast, completely blocks the drainage canals, narrow or closed angle between the iris and the cornea, develops very quickly, demands immediate medical attention. Usually, would you, usually somebody would notice this acutely because their vision would change very fast. <clears throat> Pressure on the eye increases damage to the optic nerve. That's the mechanism, pathophysiology behind the disease. Glaucoma is treatment strategy. So we want to lower our intraocular pressure. Pharmacologic mechanisms are one of two things, increasing aqueous outflow, and those are the cl drug classes that do that, or decreasing aqueous production, and that's the drugs that do that. So you'll notice alpha agonists are on both sides, so they actually have both mechanisms to help with. Many treatments can cause dry, red, or irritated eyes, so it might be important to recommend a lubricating eye drop to use. Just remember that five-minute rule. Don't have somebody put their glaucoma meds in or eye drop in and then wash it out with a lubricating drop. Um, tachyphylaxis is seen. It's a term, I don't know if you guys have covered it before, but it basically means that the drug can suddenly stop working. And that's sometimes seen with glaucoma. So you might have to switch somebody because all of a sudden um, the medication that's been working for them for three years isn't doing anything anymore. Medical cannabis, we'll talk about this uh, in a specific module next spring, but you're going to, 
hear about this from people and you probably have already. Um, glaucoma is one of the treatments uh, that's approved for cannabis use. It's one of the ones I think people talked about medical cannabis a long time ago. And I think it was always kind of a joke. It's like, oh, I have glaucoma. So, you know, I'm using my medical marijuana. Um, it actually is something that is approved for that in most states that use that allow medical treatment um, using cannabis products. Uh, I don't know how effective it is. There's a lot of eye drops that work quite well. So I'm a little bit skeptical that it's necessary, but I suppose if you've tried everything and nothing's happening, it might be worth a shot. Uh, beta blockers are the first class of drugs we'll talk about. They're the oldest drugs that have been used as primary op is the primary first line option. Um, they're historically always first line before prostaglandins came along. And we'll talk about some of the controversy here in a second. But uh, beta blockers end in OL, OL, and it's good to get to know the nomenclature of a beta blocker because you're going to have to know them on the cardio lecture next module anyway. Um, I highlighted the, I bolded the ones that are likely to be more common. Usually the dosing is twice daily. There is a Timolol gel formulation that's a once daily medication. You probably apply that at night. Um, all non-selective except for Bataxolol, so they target beta-1 receptors. It doesn't really matter. It's in the eye. It shouldn't really have systemic effects. However, some people believe that over time, using a beta blocker eye drop can cause some systemic effects. So the problem is, is that if you have beta blockade or excessive beta blockade, you might be causing adverse cardiac conditions. Uh, you might trigger asthma responses, COPD, or cause problems with diabetes. Um, we'll talk about this more when we talk about those conditions, but basically the idea here is that if you're blocking beta receptors in the lungs and you give somebody a bronchodilator that's trying to work on those beta receptors, which we'll talk about next week, it blocks the effects of those. So that's a problem. Um, same thing with COPD. Diabetes, one of the biggest signs that people, one of the easiest signs to recognize for people when they get hypoglycemic is they get tachycardic. And so if you take a beta blocker, it can mask that tachycardi tachycardic response. And so you might not know that you're hypoglycemic as easily. So there's some of the reasons why we get a little bit nervous about beta blockers in some of these diseases. But again, this should be pretty low overall incidence. You shouldn't see a lot of systemic responses with these. Lower intraocular pressure by about 20 to 30%. So pretty substantial effects here. And again, these were historically and possibly even still technically considered first line. The drug that's replaced them for the most part is the prostaglandin analogs, and they all end in prost, so they're pretty easy to remember. Um, they're all pretty common, um, Lumigan, Zalatan, Travitan, one drop bedtime dosing. They're more expensive because they're, they're newer medications. Um, the one thing to remember is that, well, a couple things. First big one is brown discoloration of the iris. So people with... Um, lower amounts of pigmentation in their eyes, people with blue eyes, green eyes, et cetera, are at higher risk uh, for getting slightly discolorated eyes. So I don't think, I, from what I understand, it's not like your eyes turn completely dark brown, but you can lose some of that, um, you can get more pigmentation in your eyes than you might otherwise have had normally. And it's about 10 to 30% incidence, depending on what you read. It is an irreversible side effect too, so it doesn't go away once you stop the drug kind of an interesting um, side effect there. So if you had somebody who's got blue eyes and they're really paranoid about this happening and they can't imagine losing their blue eyes, which would be, you know, reasonable response probably for a lot of people, uh, might not be the best choice for them. So you might want to go with the beta blocker. On the other hand, if somebody has glaucoma and they need the medication to be able to see, you might want to say, well, it's worth the risk and it's worth the risk to possibly, you know, darken your eyes a little bit so that you can actually see correctly. <laughs> so there's that uh, side of it too. So it's, it might be a conversation you have to have with the patients, but I think it's an important side effect to be aware of. Uh, lengthening and darkening of the eyelashes is another thing that happens too. Sometimes this causes people, people like this side effect. Uh, my wife would love this side effect, um, but it has to do with, it has some problems associated with it too. Some people, their eyelashes get so long that they actually touch their eye, um, the eyeball itself, and then it causes discomfort and irritation. There is a product called Latisse out there, or Bimataprost, which is the same thing. It's a prostaglandin analog, and it's simply just a cosmetic version of these drugs. It's, it would technically work for glaucoma too, but they market it purely for lengthening and darkening of eyelashes. It's a prescription product. 
systemic effects, there's nothing really significant, which is why these have taken, which is one reason why these have taken a little bit of an advantage over beta blockers. They're, um, they don't really have any systemic contraindications. They also lower intraocular pressure by about 25 to 35%, so, so somewhat higher than beta blockers. So more effective, less side effects, um, that's why they become the modern first line therapy. Also, once daily dosing, better compliance. So really, this is these two things are probably the big uh, things that people will bring up when they talk about prostaglandins. Alpha agonist, bromonidine, apraclonidine. I didn't bolt apraclonidine. It's kind of an odd one. I don't really see it used all that. Bromonidine is pretty common though. One to two drops, twice, two to three times daily. Alpha two specific. So again, remember this one has a reduction in, in humor, in aqueous humor production, but also increases outflow. So you've got both mechanisms. Maybe more irritating to the eye than beta blockers, potentially. You might get kind of a local allergic type reaction causing more stinging, itching, burning. Systemic effects. Caution and cerebral and coronary insufficiency, Renaud's disease, postural hypotension. Same kind of deal with beta blockers where people get concerned that you're going to overstimulate the alpha receptors, causing vasoconstriction in various places you don't want to because you're going to get systemic absorption. Same response for me. I don't think it's probably enough medication to get to the systemic circulation to make a difference, but it is possible, especially if you've been on the medication for quite some time. So. That is something to consider, uh, but it's more of a caution, just like the beta blockers. These lower intraocular pressure by about 18 to 27%, so one of the weaker of the three we've talked about. Alternative first-line therapy, but it's more like an adjunct second line. Some people think that bromonidine is the only one that's actually neuroprotective, where the other ones just sort of decrease ocular pressure and hopefully you preserve whatever eyesight you have left. The um, bromonidine, you might actually have some ability to protect that nerve and actually maybe regenerate some of the function potentially, but they don't really know that for sure. It's a theoretical idea. <clears throat> Excuse me. Carbonic and hydrase inhibitors, uh, brenzolamide and dorazolamide, are three to twice daily dose, usually three times a day. It's the more effective way. There's also a systemic carbonic and hydrase inhibitor called acetazolamide. And um, you don't get really any systemic effects with the ophthalmic agent. So they're a nice adjunct therapy. What they do is they alter, uh, well, they inhibit the enzyme carbonic anhydrase, which alters the way that water and CO2 get move across the bloodstream. And they end up changing the uh, kind of concentration gradient to pull fluid out is essentially what they're doing. And the way that uh, they're used as usually uh, in in uh, addition to some other therapy. So again, relatively well tolerated. You see these in combination with a couple of their products pretty commonly as add-ons. Cholinergic drugs are very often not used at all. The reason is is because they cause a nearsightedness, which makes people's vision. You know, you're trying to correct your vision with glaucoma treatment. And this actually could make it worse. So not not all that helpful. It'd be like a, a last line therapy. They are help they all they're excuse me, effective at lowering intraocular pressure pressure. It's just they're gonna cause you to have difficulty seeing. So it doesn't really have a huge effect there. Combo therapy, a couple of combination drugs out there. There's combagan, which is bromonidine and timolol. And then there's cosopt, which is dorzolamide and timolol. Both combos are really popular. And you think about eye drop compliance, waiting five minutes, closing your eye for a minute, all that kind of stuff. If you can combine these, this actually is a pretty big advantage. When you talk about combining oral tablets into two drugs in one tablet, I don't personally see the benefit of doing that. This one is, uh, this actually does make sense to me to combine these. Makes the process a lot smoother. You don't have any prostaglandin combinations though, so there's that. Okay, so you've confirmed a glaucoma diagnosis. You want to start with monotherapy. Most patients are probably going to start with a prostaglandin. If they have iris, color dis iris discoloration concerns, uh, consider a beta blocker or an alpha agonist. Usually you're going to go with the beta blocker as second line. Unless they have really severe cardiac issues, you might consider alpha agonist for first line, but that'd be really rare. Allow two to four two weeks to assess response. <clears throat> Inadequate response, you want to assess compliance, um, and then also intolerance. So compliance, are they using their eye drops correctly? Are they using them regularly? And toler intolerance, uh, is it burning too much? Are they getting any other side effects that they want to talk to you about? 
Putting it all together, assuming compliance and tolerability are not issues, you want to increase your concentration. A lot of these eye drops come in multiple different concentrations, so you might be able to up your dose that way. Or you might, maybe they're doing one drop, maybe you're saying, okay, let's try to do two drops a, a day. Switch to alternative first line agents. So if you started beta blocker, switch to prostaglandin, or you could add them on, so you can use all of them together. So you could add your beta block. Maybe you got some good response from the prostaglandin, but you still could do better, so you wanna add the beta blocker on. Perfectly reasonable, let's do that. Uh, whatever change you make, allow two to four more weeks, reassess. And then um, consider if there is intolerance, so if the patient wasn't tolerating the medic medication well, is there a lower concentration you can go to? Maybe it wouldn't burn or sting as much. Is there a different formulation? So some of them come in diff as different salt formulations or different brands. So there might be, like there's a couple different types of Timolol out there. They're all essentially the same drug, but they might patients might respond to them differently or might tolerate them better. Switch within the class, try another therapy first, allow two to four weeks and then reassess. Continue the trial and error process until safety and efficacy goals are met. Uh, consider multiple first line agents, change formulations, concentrations. Um, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors could be considered at this point if you haven't added them already. Um, cholinergic medications might even be considered if you've had severe uh, issues. Um, surgery, uh, getting a consult for um, surgery or laser procedures, and then medical cannabis would be another one to kind of think about if you've tried a lot of stuff and nothing's working as much as you want. <clears throat> Closed angle treatment, uh, surgery or laser therapy is necessary for rapid intraocular pressure reduction. Drug therapy is, there's not a lot of evidence to support that drug therapy helps. However, empirically, usually you have to wait some sort of a time to get the patient to an emergency department or to see an ophthalmologist who's on call. So generally you have to give something and it's thought that if you give a bunch of eye drops, you can help at least resolve some of the symptoms or preserve vision until they can get to this surgical intervention. So what we do is we give Timolol, apiclonidine, and pilocarpine. Those are usually the common ones. One drop each, one minute apart. They all they work the fastest, and that combination is pretty potent. So it, hopefully that sustains their vision long enough to get the provider in to, to do an intervention of some kind. Systemic medications, I've never seen this done. Acetazolamide, PO or IV. Uh, mannitol is another drug that's basically, they use this in uh, brain bleeds. So if somebody is hemorrhaging in their cerebral vasculature, if you give mannitol, it can help pull fluid into the vasculature. It basically changes the concentration gradient. And it's the same thing with the ocular fluid. It can pull fluid out of the eyes into the systemic circulation. But I, I've never seen that done for this type of a case. It's possible it's, it's, it's used, but I just don't see it like that. I usually see the eye drop route being recommended. <clears throat> macular degeneration is usually related to age. It's le leading cause of blindness and vision impairment. And there's not really a great way to, to stop this or to treat it. Best to just avoid it by staying as healthy as possible, getting eye exams, and wearing sunglasses and not staring at the sun without them. Um, the dry type progresses slowly over many years. It's less threatening than wet macular degeneration. Um, smoking is a risk factor, unknown cause, but develops as people's eyes age. It's a common uh, issue with older adults. Wet type usually develops from the dry form. Um, it's more severe and progressive rapidly, and it's associated with the abnormal blood vessels leaking fluid or blood into the macula. Um, so we do treat that more aggressively. So for dry, really, it's just lifestyle modifications and vitamins. That's There's some vitamins that are thought uh, to be better um, and to protect against this from happening, but this, the evidence is really limited. So, I mean, sure, I would just, I wouldn't recommend, the, the annoying thing that I, I'll just get on a little soapbox here for a second. One of the things is that I see people coming into the hospital and they're taking like a Centrum or a regular multivitamin, and then they take a special eye formulation too. Well, the, their multivitamin probably has all this stuff in it and taking the eye formulation doesn't add anything to it. So uh, one multivitamin is probably going to be sufficient for that. Laser therapy might also help too, depending on, on where you want to go with that. Um, wet, I put a video up here of somebody getting an intravitreal injection, which kind of creeps me out. But th they, we have these VEGF inhibitors, which I talked about a couple of these, like Avastin, with... Um, when we talked about chemotherapy, about one month for one to three injections until improvement is pretty common. These are pretty expensive drugs, but um, they do work well for this. You can also give steroids intravitreal like triamcinolone. This is going to be, of course, very specialized um, medicine for ocular interventions, but just thought I'd mention it briefly. 
anyway, that's it for this lecture and I'll see you next week and we'll talk about respiratory.